It's nearly a quarter of a century since Paul McGrath retired from professional football and yet his status as a national hero has only grown. The pinnacles of his club career were at Manchester United and Aston Villa, where he won trophies and the affections of supporters. But his achievements with the Republic of Ireland under Jack Charlton, while battling his own personal demons, are what have made him a unique and beloved figure in this country. After all, not every player gets a chant all of their own. Paul, it's, it's great to chat to you. It's great, great to see you. Lovely to see you as well, Tommy. Um, I think the last time I saw you on screen was in the curry sauce ad. <laughs> oh, oh dear, oh dear. No, 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 I was very impressed. Did me best, did me best. <laughs> so, uh, did you ever think of acting as a, as a uh, career option? No, <laughs> no, and that didn't change my mind either. That, 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 no, that wouldn't be a good thing for me. Um, the national treasures thing. Um, how does that sit with you now, you know, with the, with the benefit of, of experience? How do you view all that sort of thing? Um, as a bit of a laugh, I think, you know, because obviously, you know, there, there's, uh, there's, there's players who I look up to, you know, and I think they're national treasures, but they, they've gone before me and stuff like that. But I don't, I don't think of myself as anything but someone who likes uh, curried sauce the odd time. And <laughs> does, does being a, a granddad change your perspective on things? Yeah, it's, it, it, you have to take things a little more serious. And, um, you know, you have to... You have to try and b provide for your children if they need things for their for their kids and stuff like that. But my, a lot of my kids have good jobs now and stuff like that, so I don't. It's not as bad as I thought it would be, anyway. Yeah. Um, but it's great. It's great, and I love them. I love them all. They're 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 just brilliant. Um, can you believe you're into your seventh decade? <laughs> uh, you didn't. <laughs> you know, Tell you. me you didn't have to put it like that. <laughs> uh, How's the body holding up? Yeah, grand. That's the one thing I'm amazed by, <laughs> that the actual body is holding up. But um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, lo I, I took up golf uh, when I finished football and um, I'm still shocking at it, but I love, uh, that's my way now of just uh, trying to keep a little, a little fit. Do you still think of yourself as Paul McGrath, the footballer, uh, or it, does that seem like a different lifetime ago now? Different lifetime, yeah. that was a lifetime away. Uh, but I still love watching football. I love the way it's um, it's changed and uh, the speed that it's it, it is now. I love watching Man City at the moment because I think the the way they move the ball from back to front so quickly and so you know with the players they have obviously so brilliantly. And I love watching the fact that Manchester United are still still up there and having a chance of of of, of doing well. Um, would you, do you think you could have played yourself in the modern game? No. Not Definitely a, not? Not a chance, not a chance. Don't know about that. No, it, well, if they brought back tackling, <laughs> I, I'd be able to play in it. No, because I loved, there was, I, I found there was an art in, in tackling that should have, should have been appreciated and should still be around today, but I think even my, the way I tackled when, in my day, I think would still be classed as a foul now. Mm. So I don't think I'd have had a chance to, to play the way these lads do now. I think you're being typically modest uh, there about that one, but you still have the, the love there. Um, oh, yeah. I, wanted, I want you to take us back to when, when football entered your life. And, you know, you've spoken before about, you know, the, the difficult start you had in life. Um, take us into the head of the little kid who suddenly realises that this is something that they love, that they they can throw themselves into. What was that like for you as, as, a, as a kid? I was in school in Sally Noggin and I was, uh, Tommy Heffernan came to me uh, during a break and just said, would you come up to uh, Pierce Rovers? And it, I think it was under 13s. And there was three of us he asked to go, John Young, myself, and uh, Kiernan Forsyth. Tommy actually spent a lot of time with his honest beauty of a beauty board, trying to tell me in particular, not the other two, because they, they were already playing in teams and they were they were good players. But he used to just put up this and tell me where I was supposed to be running, who I was supposed to be tackling, and he took ages and ages and ages trying to tell me how to do it. But I I, I, I loved listening to him and I loved I wanted to learn the game. I wanted to become better. But uh and so he was the first man who, who actually got out that thing and just said, Look, Paul, if you see this guy gets the ball, you, you can go to him and just try and tackle him and stuff like that. And if this lad, tr if he puts it in here, you've got to come back and help these. So he taught, basically taught me the game in, in 
very simple terms. So you're a, a long way from the player that, that you would become um, at, at this stage. Um, did, 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 play, did playing football give you self-confidence? It, was it a way of kind of expressing yourself? Oh, of course. Yeah, to be honest, Tommy, it was, it was, it was everything to me because I, I knew I was a, a reasonable player and I knew that I was a quick... I was a quick enough player to, if I made mistakes in football, I could correct them quite quickly, you know. So if someone did win the ball off me, I was able to turn, chase and bump, bang, and get it back and give it to someone who could actually, you know, play a little better probably than I could. So I, I used to do that, and I used to think, geez, I'm getting out of trouble here. Even when I get into trouble, I can... I know how to get out of it. Mm. Your friends at the time talk about and uh, that you had an obsession. You know that you were you'd be doing push-ups, you'd be organising five-a-side games, you'd be doing you know the commentary. Like yeah, it was you're one of those kids who were were just uh, totally obsessed with it. Were you thinking at that stage, oh, I could I could make make a job out of this, or I could, this could be my life, or no. was that no, early that, days? Yeah, no, that was too early th at that stage. I was just thinking look, like this could be great just for me to to. Um, show people because I loved showing off. I loved, I loved to think that I was the best player, on, in, especially in the school in Sally Nod. And I used to think, you know, I was just trying to show off. When you're, when you're a kid, and, and obviously you've come through a different background than everybody else, is it a way of warding off trouble, warding off bullies that everybody kind of goes, oh, yeah. suddenly you've got status now? You're the, you're the yeah. guy who's good at football. Oh, exactly, yeah. It was. It was a way of just making a statement that, look, you know, I know you're against me today, but I'd rather we were both in the same team and, and we win something together. Um, from Pierce Rovers, you, you, your next stage is Dock United and Frank Mullen and Billy Behan and people who would become very big, important figures in your story and, and, and where, where it would go. Um, yeah. This is, it turned in, in, in the way things panned out, it ended up as being more just a football club to pay for. It was sort of like a family, they, they looked after you um, they really did, and, yeah. and would, would lead to bigger things down the line. Yeah, they, they'd, um, they'd got me jobs, they, they, you know, they knew that I, I'd come from an orphanage, that, all that stuff was explained anyway, because he had to ask the, the, the master down in the home, he had to ask him could I come to play for Dorky and stuff like that. So I went up to Dorky and they treated me so well and everything was... You know, you were picked up here at a certain time. You were brought to wherever it was we were playing and stuff. And I, I actually just loved it. But we, we were playing with grown men then. Mm. So, and I, I think I was 17 and John Young was 17 and Gramps had come down with us. And we enjoyed our time there. There, We really did. Frank Mullen and uh, uh, Tommy Cullen in particular just took us under his wing and he, he used to try and protect us from the, <laughs> the horde. Yeah. Um, but they were a great team and I loved playing I, geez, there was nothing better than getting picked on that team because um, there were lads like that that would do your tackling for you if you need if anyone was annoying you or trying to steam into you they were protective very protective of us three because we were we were only kids really to be honest you know so if anyone mi mixed it with you they they mixed sorted it, with it out for you. They, they looked after you it. on the field and off it. They did. They did actually. because um, you you know they they really helped out. You had a, a a difficult time around the age of eighteen when you know you you ended up in hospital. I think it was mm. uh, a situation where where you had a, a bit of a breakdown for a few months. Yeah, and coming out of that took its time, mm. but with your mother and with their help, slowly you put put things back together. Is that a, a yeah. fair enough? The lads from the team used to come up and try and make me want to, um, you know, just... Well, they came up initially just to see me and to make sure that I was OK. And uh, I was away with the fairies. I just wasn't well. Mm. I, I, I was doing things that were mad when I was in St. Brandon's. And um, they all thought I was, I'd never play football again. I, yeah, it was a struggle because I knew that I was very very sick I was very very sick and uh, yeah I wanted to come back to the lads because it, it was hard to watch and my mum used to come up my mum used to come up with um, her, her her second husband and they were they would just want me to get well mm. they would nothing else they, they didn't care about the football they just wanted me back uh, being well so um, yeah it was strange it was a very strange time for me anyway um, you get back 
on the field and, and things are going well and there, there's a kind of a time where you're, you're playing your football, you've got a job at this stage, you know, you've got your family um, relationship with your mother and your family and life is, life is going steady. Is there a kind of alternative version that you ever think of? I wonder if I'd never gone to Pats and, and Old Trafford and all that and just kept going or were you always kind of thinking, no, I think bigger things might be awaiting me? No, I was thinking, isn't it great that I'm, I'm, I'm well, I'm away from the, the stuff that I've just gone through? Because that, would, that was hard enough to go through. It was just mm. totally mental. It was a mental, total mental, mental breakdown. So when I, got, when I got well and suddenly this thing was still there, I went back to Dorky and I started playing one or two games with them. And I said I'd never go back. I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to play football. I didn't want to kick a ball again. But I went back, and, I, and, I, and then it took off straight away. You, you start playing for Pats, and you know pretty quickly, you kind of become a star. You were getting write-ups in the papers. I think you know the, the famous nickname, the, the Black Pearl of Inchicore which is, you know, probably of its time, but very affectionate uh, in terms of what yeah. you were doing. You know, r people raving about you. You win Player of the Year that season for, for Pats um, for, the, for the League of Ireland. Um, are, you, are you loving it? Loving the attention? Loving the bit of profile? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um, no, I never, to be honest, Tommy, I, didn't, I never was one for, you know, getting, getting the prizes and stuff like that. I would have much prefer mm. the low key thing and, and uh, I just genuinely loved playing football. The most the most ex happiest I was was when I was out on a football pitch for that 90 minutes just trying to do my best and trying to score a goal or, and trying to play well or put in a few tackles. You know, people started, it got bigger and bigger because people were starting to say, geez, he's, you know, you might be going here and you might be going there. So, so that, was, uh, that, that was a bit of the, uh, the hard part for me anyway. Seeing your name in the papers and people talking See, about you like that. Oh, no, but I, I loved reading my name yeah. in the papers. You know, I used to go home and, uh, and, and show me mum and I'd be going, geez, that's, that's me. And you know what, I got an eight. I got an eight in the paper this week, mum. That's eight, you know. So I was one of those. So my ego, yeah, was still there, mm. uh, you know. But I, but I didn't let it. Uh, I wouldn't have let it run away with me too much. That that I was, I was suddenly one of these, you know, superstars. And St. Pat's was just. They they always were. They were just a brilliant club to me. Mm. So you get the trial at United. It goes well. Um, you're offered a deal. Just tell me what that's like. You know, I, I don't care what era it is. You know, for. A kid growing up obsessed with football and suddenly you're being told you're a Manchester United player. I mean, is that, and I know there'd been a lot of talk in the maybe the months and years building up that it was going to happen, but did it blow your mind? Um, it did, it did, um, until, until I heard the actual money, money <laughs> side of things. I said, I earn more money than in Dublin than I do, that this man's offer me, Ron. His this is Ron Atkinson, of Ron course. Ron Atkinson. Yeah. And I'm saying, would it be possible um, to go in and just say, can you bump the money up a little bit? Like, Paul's, he loves the, the idea of playing for you, but he just wants you to bump the money up. And Ron, of course, being Ron, just knew that I had no, I'd, no one was representing me. So he, he, he just said, well, no, we've made him an offer now. He can, you know, if he wants to hop back on a plane now, he's that rude, Ron. He says if he, he wants to jump on a plane to back to Dublin, he can do it. You know that's no problem. We've no problem with that if if he wants to do that. Or, and I and then I came back tail in between legs and I said, I just, Ron, I didn't say I, I didn't like the money. I just said, I you know, and I am kind of happy with the money. Because there's no exactly question of you going back on the no the plane. To no, there's no yeah. way I was going to go back. Um, how did you find that culture <coughs> shock of? of leaving Pats and, and, and Dublin and, and, and working as well and your family to suddenly you're mixing with Brian Robson and Gordon McQueen and, and all these names yeah. that you would have seen on Match of the Day. Yeah, I found, it, I found that strange as well because even Bobby Charlton's walking around the place and you suddenly you're seeing Nobby Styles at this, this end of thing and 
Sir Matt Busby's walking around and he stopped. Sir Matt Busby is the only person who, or, and Bobby Charlton did, I must admit, to, to stop and just say, you know, how are you doing? Are you, you know, mm. well, just keep what you're doing because we think you're going to be, you're going to do okay here. And so it was, there was names like that and, and you just felt, Jesus Christ, I, this is unbelievable talking to those people. And, and you meet um, a, a young kid from Belfast called Norman Whiteside. Yeah. who you become firm friends with. And I think he was maybe about 17 at the time. You were 22. Yeah. How do you, how do you end up buddying up with him so closely? Well, you know, we, we were in the same digs. We, were, we all slept on, in the same room. And he was just, he was lord of the digs, though. He, Norman was, he was six foot two. He, he, was, he was a proper man. At, he was 16, though. He was only 16, but he was as hard as nails. So he says... Uh, and he and he had the box, you know, the box that turns the TV over and all that sort of thing. So you you become a United player, but there's still a bit of work to do to get to become a, a first team player, um, I guess. Uh, but over the couple of couple of ye seasons, um, you work your way in, and you're also like you bought a BMW, I think, at some stage. Yeah, and <laughs> I did. I bought a, a yellow, <laughs> one of the oldest looking BMWs I've ever seen. I bought them off. There was a Greek waiter at the top of the. Old Trafford uh, Road there, and he was had this heat but th that barely didn't work. So he sold it to me. I think it was about a thousand pounds or something like that. So I thought it was the bee's knees. Now I have a car. You meet Claire at this stage, who would become your first wife, and mm -hmm. you have a, a child quite quite quickly. Um, and it, there's a it's sort of a stable and serene, and and Christopher comes along, and yeah, and, and life is quite calm and. And, and I want to say normal, but straightforward at, at this. At what, what kind of father were you? Um, yeah, I think I was a good father. I, I, I loved, I loved the fact that Christopher had come, and and, and uh, he, he was, uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a lovely child, a lovely baby, and uh, Claire was a gorgeous wife, and um, yeah, everything seemed to be settling down. The, the breakthrough, if you like season ends up with the the FA Cup final in 1985 I think it's it's when you, you sort of really felt you established yourself as a player would that be fair to say yeah um yeah. people might, younger people might not realize back then the FA Cup final day was oh. the biggest day in the calendar so again you're a few years over from Ireland mm. and it was such an eventful match as well what are, what oh. are your memories of, of that day oh well I think it was just it was a huge game for for us um, yeah, w when the game started, uh, w w we were doing great. We were, you know, matching them uh, up and down the park. And then um, I tried to slip ball into into Kevin and um, Peter Reid, I should say. He comes right in and cuts it out. And um, Kevin just kind of lifts him out of it. He just tackles him, and, and he goes up in the air. I thought it was a brilliant tackle myself, but <laughs> he sent Kevin off, and, and Kevin was distraught about that. Like, you know, he was trying to... The first man ever sent off. first man final, ever yeah. sent off. And, and I was kind of hiding at that stage. Like, I was standing behind people and everything, just just so no one could see me, because in case I got called out. It was you that passed that ball, wasn't it? But, but you went on to the 10 men. One, no, one Norman one scored one of the best goals I've seen scored at, uh, on, on that day, yeah. And then... Obviously, we're all we're all elated and delighted, and um, yeah, it was a tough game though. It was a tough game with ten men against, and they were a really good team, Everton. You yeah. know, they really, really were. So, so to, to be able to beat them with uh, a man down. And was, Frank Stapleton alongside oh, you at the back, wasn't he? Yeah, and he was magnificent on the day. He was absolutely brilliant on the day. I think he he played there all his life, but he. And he kept shouting at us, Tell, you've got to keep telling me what to do. You know, he took charge, though. He was the one that was doing all the shouting. Keep telling me what to do, keep telling me. I'm saying, would you have to shut up and let's play the game? Like, you know, <laughs> a lot of us have to chip in here. But we we did it, and uh, it was a wonderful day. Jeez, a wonderful day. Because that's the first thing I'd, I'd won. Um, in, in your book, though, when you talk about the celebrations of that, you say you, you are hearing voices of self-doubt at that time, even though you've made it at United, you're a cup winner, you know, you're breaking through international scene around that time as well. Yeah. You, you still sort of felt, did you feel, oh, I'm going to get found out here or I don't belong here? Um, no, no, I thought I belonged there, but I was doing, I, was, I think I was doing things that were a little 
off the 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 would I say off the wall? Yeah, off the wall. Because, it, like, if if myself and Norman were injured, we'd just... M me and Norman would look over, he'd be on one bed, I'd be on the other, and we'd, we'd have our knees done, and then we'd say, what are you doing for the rest of, you know, for the rest of the, d the day? Why don't we just go for a few after this? And, and that, that kind of became a routine with myself and Norman, and, you know, we, we were that daft that we didn't think it would get back to them. Mm. You know what I mean? And they knew well that uh, we weren't behaving in the way a, a professional who's, who's injured, of all things, uh, should be behaving. So, People say about the, the team that, that Ron had there that went very close. I think in, you know, in today's terms, I mean, they were top four every year that you were there under Ron, you know, winning cups. They'd probably be regarded as, as a, a certain degree a success, but that the drinking culture at the club yeah. was holding them back, you know, whether it was yourself and Norman or Brian Robson oh, yeah. and a number of other players maybe involved in that. Yeah. Looking back now, do you think that was the case? Did that, yeah. that would stop the team going over? Oh, yeah, most definitely. And, and, and I think when Sir Alex had us up in, the, uh, up, up, up in, the, um, in his office and telling us this, is, 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 this can't go on, it's stupid. Like, what are you doing to yourselves? You're, 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 you're forcing my hand anyway. And um, I, I would have to say that um, I think Sir Alex had intimated to one or two people that I got to hear about that he didn't, I wasn't one of the players he was, he was particularly happy with at Old Trafford. And this was before he'd even arrived at the place. So I knew I was for the heave-ho anyway. Um, um, when, when Big Ron left, and you, you liked Ron, didn't you? Yeah, I yeah. liked Ron, yeah. In personality terms, in his football oh, style, yeah. and yeah, yeah, I liked everything about Ron because he, he made he made the training so fun. Mm. The problem was he joined in it. That was that was something I I, I could have done without. But he was he was actually okay. Yeah. And Fergie, look, the, the history would show he would he would be right in what he came in. But exactly, he puts your hackles up right away in terms of the way he, he speaks to you. Is that is that right? He's very domineering on yes. Yeah. I, I, the first game we played uh, was Oxford away, I think, and um, he put me in midfield. I was a centre half. He put me in midfield, and then he took me off at half time. That warm side, I could not find it, honestly. I, I, and I, I, I liked what he was trying to do and stuff like that. But I think, in your first game, if you if you're going to play a person like me, out of position. And then take me off at half time. You're trying to tell me something. I know you're trying to mm. tell me something. He admitted that he handled you wrong. He said he could have. He said if it, it had been, if he'd have been a more experienced manager, he would have been more fatherly. You know that that he almost needed to mellow himself as the years as the years la later on. And he would probably handle players differently later. I think he's he's doing himself a misservice yeah. there because I think what he did was was totally right for for Manchester United. You know, and that's. That his job was to get to root out what was happening, what was happening at Manchester United that was wrong, yeah. and me and Norman at that stage were wrong for Manchester United. That's what I believe, anyway. It comes to head in, in 1989, and they offer you 100 grand to basically retire and a yeah. testimonial. So you're and you'd had a terrible time, as you mentioned, with, with your injuries yeah, over many. the preceding seasons. Mm -hmm. um, do you consider it? Yeah, I did consider it, but I, uh, Gordon Taylor, I think, was with me at, at that time. Kevin was there. The PFA. Yeah, yeah, Kevin was, was around, so I could talk to him. And Brian Robson was around, and Norman, actually. And I'd, I'd said, no. I said, look, I, I can still play football. I know for a fact that my legs will still allow for me to play football. So I said, yeah, I'm going to uh, play on. And I said it to Gordon Taylor. And Gordon was delighted. Gordon said, I'll go in and tell um, Sir Alex that you're, you're, no matter what they're offering you, you're still going to play on. Mm. And in he marched and just said it to him. So, and I was delighted. I was thinking, Jesus, the, the, the bravery of the man just saying that to him. Like, you know, do what you want, he said. He's, he's still going to play football for someone. And, uh, and then year, a few, a year or two later, he said, uh, well, the only inquiry we had was from Liverpool and we weren't going to sell him to Liverpool and I'm thinking Jesus but well, thanks for telling me so you could have gone to Liverpool I could have gone to Liverpool because I, th I think they they knew what Alex was playing with here he just wanted me out of football so I'm not playing for anyone else which is I think it was just kind of cruel would you have gone 
to Liverpool. In a heartbeat. Oh, like a shot from a gun. <laughs> yeah. Like a shot from a gun. Maybe take a step back and just I want to talk about your, your sense of Irishness um, even before being capped. Obviously, you're growing up uh, as a black Irish person when there wasn't too many around in yeah. the 60s and 70s. Very true. Um, what was that like? Was it, difficult? was it a difficult time and did some people try and make you feel any less Irish uh, at that time? Um, no, no, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't yeah. too bad, but there was you're always going to get it on a football pitch if you're playing against someone who wants to rile you up and stuff like that it was, it's easy to just say you know you call, call me a um a black bastard or nigger or whatever they want to call me anyway so uh and those i i, I never used used to uh react to reading reading in your in your book about this time you were proud of your of being black, you had black heroes. You know, you Pele in oh. seventy and Phil Linnett and you yeah. know, Muhammad Ali. You know, that was you weren't sort of saying, "I wish I was everybody like everybody else." You were no, no, no. But but yeah. but I went round thinking I was like everyone else anyway. Because yeah. the only time I felt that the the black thing was when when I looked in the mirror. I genuinely mixed with people who were uh, where, where I grew up. I'm, I'm mixed with everyone, n never a problem sort of thing. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of being the colour I am, so, you know, it's no, uh, makes no difference to me. And it's only when other people bring it up yeah. that, that, I, that I suddenly go, yeah, well, geez, yeah, yeah you, you're, you're right, you know, I'm, I'm slightly different, but so what? You were, I suppose, eff effectively, though, a groundbreaker for a different kind of Irishness in that time, because at that time it was very much, you know, white... Catholic, you know, traditional, that's what Irish looked like and, and you came through. And in the decades since, you know, what it is to be Irish is a very different thing now. It's a very broad thing. So do you feel a certain sense of pride that maybe there was kids looking at you in Italia 90 and 94 kind of went, yeah, you know? Well, he, yeah, I, I hope, I'd hope so. I'd hope so because it's great. Um, Ireland have always been very accepting, I think, anyway. You know, you're, you're obviously going to get the odd fool who, who who will say a thing to you but our irish people have always been very uh welcoming to all sorts of different cultures and and, and different peoples so yeah we're, we, we're we're one of those people who, who don't who don't turn people away and and you know um are, are always helping even countries further afield and stuff like that so that's what i love about ireland and i love about the irish and we don't we don't seem to go out of our way to harm other people uh, in other places or anything like that. So it's, it's been a fabulous country for me anyway to grow up in. Um, so when you were called up to the Ireland squad then, another dream, you know, whatever about uh, United and Cups, this is, this is another one that every, every young footballer would have. Is, is this another moment where you're, you're, your mind is blown, you're meeting more heroes, the Liam Brady's, the this Lawrence's? Goes, this is a, goes up another uh, pedestal though I think. Another, this is under Owen's time isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, under Owen's time. I had to kind of uh, do it in the way I, I normally did things which was I'd have to ease my way in very slowly. Yeah, it was that shyness that's... Was, I've always had that yeah. this thing of just being really really shy, shy of women, shy of fellas, shy of just, just not wanting to be in too many people's company at once and I would have been a bit in awe of, of Liam because I'd um, you know, I just thought he was one of the, well, he still is one of my heroes, you know. And in February 1986, uh, the, the whole history of the country changes, you might say. Um, Jack Charlton is appointed Irish manager. Not that you're that enthusiastic to start off with. Is that right to say? That would be you're right. Sure? To, that would be right to <laughs> say. Yeah, I, I thought it was a bit of a strange one, uh, you know, an Englishman coming to be the... Uh, main man at, at f of the Irish national team. I didn't think that was. I didn't think that was right. Um, so so yeah, I would have had a, a a little bit of a whine about that. Yeah. How quickly does he win you over though? Um, the first training session. The first training session was so unusual. It was, 
he was talking about colors. You jumped on certain colors and stuff. We did. I think we did it in a in, in a gymnasium, and he was going puce, and I didn't ever knew puce was a color. <laughs> and and he was going touch it, touch the air. When I, when I say puce, it's up in the air. When I say, and they, they were so strange the colors. But we were we were doing it, and we were kind of laughing. And they were trying to think of the colors as well. So because we no one wants to make a mistake, because you didn't want to be sent home on the first the first time you've met him. But he did it in a funny way as well. He was laughing with the, as we were jumping, because some of the lads just couldn't get it right at all. But um, even on the first day, I think he had the lads. I honestly do, on the first day, by throwing in this weird kind of um, training session. It was kind of quirky and different. It was so quirky, yeah, and, and so different. But he, I think he did it on purpose. Again, I mm -hmm. think that Jack does certain things just for... Uh, you know, just to keep you on your toes, it's nothing to do with him. He, he just, but honestly, because he called me James so many times, that I, I obviously answered to it. Um, but I thought, I used, I used to think, well, what, what happens when he calls me Paul then again, you know? But he, but he did it for so long that I, I just answered to it. And yeah. whatever the game was, I, I, I kind of played it. And, and he knew my name all along. Yeah. You know what I mean? He did. The, the the Finding Jack Charlton film, I think, people who, who've seen it, um, it was such a reminder of what a, what a man he was, that he was the boss, it was his way or the highway, very much so, but at the same time, so warm, so one, so fun, um, you know, s such great humanity about him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd caused him one or two problems along the way. And I remember one in particular when I was, there was a band, Jurezi, who wanted me to do uh, this single with them. So I'd went to the studios and I was so nervous and I said, would it be okay if I had a couple of, couple of pints and stuff like that? So, and I, I had the couple of pints and then I said, would you, would you mind, I'm, I'm not a singer, you, you, you girls sing and stuff like that, would you mind if I had an, another couple of pints and stuff? I, 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 get up the next morning and I'm saying to Kevin, geez, Kevin, I'm still buzzing from, from the night before. And, but I was coming down a little bit. So as we're getting to the stadium, um, Jack comes back and said, Paul, look, we need you to play. Just come into the ground, come into the ground, and we will get you a car then from the ground if you don't want to play. And I said, I, but I can't walk through the crowd to go into the thing. This is what I'm trying to tell you is I'm, I'm Whatever I've drunk, it's not been good for me, and I don't feel well. So uh, eventually, Jack says, "Paul, if you don't, if you don't get off now, this could be the last time you ever play for us." And I said, "I hate, I, I honestly hate saying this, but it might be the last time I play for you then, because I really don't feel well, and I didn't feel well." And um, Eddie Bryan then came along and just said, "Paul, I'll." I'll take you back to the hotel. So we walk, and it was so surreal. We were walking in the opposite direction to get a taxi to bring me back to the, to the hotel and, and walking through the crowd and them seeing me walking through the crowd when I was supposed to be playing a game. And I knew I let them down that day. And then they won, obviously they beat them five, I think it was five now or something. And I was just shivering in, in the bed. I was, there was sweat everywhere. And he walks in the bed and he pulls the, the blankets down and I was just covered in sweat. And, uh, and he just went, he said, oh, sorry, son. He said, I, I didn't realize how hard you got it. And uh, he just took the, took the things under my chin and he just said, uh, I'll be back later on, I'll be back later on. Mm. And, and I think in that, even in seeing me that way, he just thought, oh, Jesus Christ, what a state. But he didn't kick you out. He didn't. You know, no. he had that caring. Oh no, that's what I, I paternal. Was, I was amazed that he'd even come down to the room to me. To be honest, <clears throat> and you run through brick walls then for him. Oh, I would because I, of that. But yeah, and, and that's what I always wanted to do. I will always wanted to say, please make, pick me for the next one, and I will promise you, no, I won't be drinking up to that game, and I will give you mm. a game that you want, and we we win that game. I'm telling you. Mm. Um. The results start to come, and he's, he's obviously got that sort of effect on everybody because everybody starts running through brick walls for yeah. him. And then you, you still need, though, for, for Euro 88, the famous Gary Mackay 
goal for Scotland against Bulgaria. Where were you when you heard when you heard I, that? I was that in we'd actually qualified. I was in hospital uh, getting my left knee done, and Kevin Moran rang me in the hospital, and he said in in Bupa in in Manchester, and he said, he said, we're, we're, I didn't even know the game was on. I yeah. wasn't watching any games. I wasn't doing that. And I was just sitting in the hospital, and he, he rang me, and he said, uh, we're true. We're, we're you know, we, we've made it through. And I went, true to where? And he said, we were in the Euros. We're in the Euros. I said, what do you mean we're in the Euros? Sure, didn't, didn't we? we? We finished. And he said, no, Gary Mackay. Gary Mackay scored a goal. We're, we're going. And that was the first I'd heard of it. So, and it was absolutely, geez, pandemonium after that because it was just great for, for our, being our first competition. And you were kind of sad because you knew there was only going to be a certain amount of people coming on that trip and I was and here's me sitting in bed with me knee in plaster yet again hoping that I was going to be ready for it so uh, yeah it was tough. But you were ready for it and you were there on the field in Stuttgart. I, I was indeed. I was um, indeed. <laughs> it's kind of a mythical day now for, for, it, for, for Ireland like what pictures does it conjure in your mind? I, I remember I was getting off the bus and, and Mick Byrne shouted up at uh, there was a crowd of uh, Irish lads uh, um, it's kind of like we were lower in the stadium, but he and he looks up and he will do them for you today. And I'm going, Mick, don't be telling them that, Jesus, you never know, you know. But I love the way he did it, like you know, because he Mick always thought we were going to hammer them anyway. No, but I knew, and all the Irish players knew though. If you if you measured up the English players to the Irish players, there wouldn't be much in it. Do you know what I mean? They genuinely wouldn't. You know, people would have thought because they had the Linekers and the Robsons and the this, that and the other. We had, we had lads that were brilliant, brilliant footballers. But uh, yeah, we went at them. We just went at them and then we scored this great goal. Something good is going to happen to your team that day when yeah. the smallest man on the pitch puts a header in over Tony Adams and people. The lovely thing for us was though, we didn't have, uh, the Irish fans were no trouble. And that was another bonus for us. You know? So the team were doing us proud and the fans were doing uh, themselves proud and yeah. it was just a real yeah. sense of general just accomplishment. Just carnival, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a carnival atmosphere. And then to, to beat England on, on the first game, geez, you're thinking, we're going to win it. You know, we're, we're, we're that good, we're brilliant. <laughs> and mind you, they had a right few shots. Packy was brilliant on the day, I have to say that. Well, you, when you go home and you get the homecoming, but the memory of the per performances and how you acquitted yourself, does that then feed into the confidence of the team into the Italian 90 qualifiers that suddenly it's not, oh, here's Ireland, they're underdogs. Yeah. You're a serious team now. Yeah, I think everyone um, would have thought that, you know, that these lads, they come to play, they play a different sort of game and stuff like that, but they just will not give you a second piece on a football pitch. I think in the Russian game, um, because Ronnie was playing and I wasn't playing, mm. I think the lads got it down and they started playing football. Now, I'd never seen Ireland play as, as well that night. I was raging I, was, I wasn't even on the pitch. Now, I, I had got an injury, so that's my only excuse. <laughs> um, but, but that's the best I've seen an Irish team play. Uh, and that, that was a very, very good Russian team. And I, and I genuinely thought... And I thought I wouldn't get my place back because I thought, Jesus... And he scored the goal as well, the Shinner. Yeah. So I'm going, I've no chance now. But Ronnie, Ronnie, I would have, I would have kept Ronnie in, to be if, I, if, yeah. if, if I'm going to be honest about it, you know, even though it would have ruined my day. I want to talk about Italia 90, but before that, um, I want to talk about a, a, another transfer that never happened. You're a big star now between sort of uh, after 88 and oh, before 90. Going. And <laughs> is it true that you were approached by Napoli to play alongside Diego Maradona? That is actually quite true, but it kind of got switched a little bit because he said to me, no, th there was a huge boat out in the harbor. I was on a, this free holiday and I was just, there was a load of ta Italians in this restaurant. And they kept saying to me that senior, senior someone was coming down to see me. And then they pointed to this boat that was well offshore and it was huge. It was a, a, a boat. And this um, phone call came in and said, Mr. 
Mr. whatever his name is, is out in his boat at the moment. He's just saying, are, are you in? Can he come in and talk to you now? And I said, is that his boat? Like, yeah, of course he can come in. So this fella came in now. He didn't talk much, obviously, much English. And uh, he said, Paul McGrath, what would it take to get you? What would it take to get you here? And I was thinking, two bob. <laughs> take two bob. And uh, he was chatting away and stuff like that. And then he said, and, and um, about Ronnie Whelan, what, what about, how, how much do you think it would take to get Ronnie Whelan here? <laughs> I'm thinking, am I being set up here? He wants Ronnie. Because I was thinking to myself, imagine me and Mar. I had all, all setting up in my head. Me and Maradona, it's a one-two in the middle of the pitch, and I'm in there, and I'll score the goal. But, uh, yeah, I think it was Ronnie they wanted. Maybe in the long run, given what El Diego was at off the field over yeah. there. I, oh, I wouldn't know. Yeah. I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made it. But I loved, I loved the football he played, uh, Diego. Yeah. He was just pretty, oh, he was just amazing. Well, you were in Italy yourself uh, pretty, uh, pretty soon after that with the team. Um, you know, you've talked about that that special journey that that the whole country went on. What what are your memories of that of that tournament of that summer of everything that you that you did and accomplished uh, in in that extraordinary few weeks? Yeah, I think it was it, it was it was just brilliant for all the players that were there because we again, I'm think I'm talk, talking about that bond thing. We just bonded as players. I mean, the the, the Romania game was incredible because Hadji was one of these players who just gets the ball and just he just decides he, mm. he might sidestep four people and then have a shot, you know. And then when it went to the penalties, I hid. <laughs> I mm. hid. Um, no, I didn't want to take one of the penalties. And uh, thank God David was, David was back in and he took, uh, he took the last penalty and, um, and scored the goal. So that was kind of fitting, really, that... Uh, he'd been out for so so long, and and then to come back and you know score the winning winning penalties was was brilliant for him. And you were seeing all the pictures from home being sent out to you, weren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. We were seeing the the mad pictures at home where people were just going nuts at this stage because everything was clicking into place. And when I say everything, I think even knowing that I don't think we're going to have enough for the Italians, and that was the. That was the uh, the, sa the downside of it. But you gave a pretty good account of yourselves on the night. Oh yeah, we did. Like we were trying so hard, but but I think uh, I think that you know they well deserved to, to mm. win win on the night as well. You were um, voted our best player of the tournament, and it, I think you you'd vowed not to not to drink for the tournament and to actually. Yeah. Give it your absolute best shot. Yeah, because so you had that sense of reward for, for for doing that. I said I have to go out here and I have to give it my best shot for you know for once in my life I have to go out and just not let anyone down or not you know try to let anyone down and and it worked out okay. It worked out okay. It would you know I would have liked him to kick on a, another couple of times, but yeah. um, you know I think we we were all proud of each other, and that was that's what it's all about. You can't. If you're not, uh, you're not going to win the major prize. You know, you just want to show people that you're doing, you've done your best. Well, let's have a look at the the welcome that awaited you then when you got back to Dublin. And I think we have a little clip here uh, of when Jack introduced you to the crowd. The tide had turned. People saw economic and social progress. Employment was rising. Immigration had almost ceased. We just grew up. We just got a sense of self-respect, a sense of pride. Politically, economically, we had won the right to take our place as a nation. The next thing we're going to win. Because if we could possibly win the World Cup, then we have to question everything. How do you feel watching that now? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's nice, you know. Very nice. At the time, even in a moment like that, and within your your struggles, and you know, were you able to take a step back and and 
and think of your think of your mother, think of your childhood, the journey you'd come on, and 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 think, my God, I haven't done too bad. You know, was um, it a, a feeling yeah, of, of but pride? I think I think it was more a feeling of, um, you know, the team doing well rather than you personally. Mm. You know, it always was that seriously. So in in the the madness and the glory and the adulation of the crowd and the country and the, the national treasure thing like I thought about I talked about at the start the thing that resonates for you 30 odd years later wherever you are is the friendship and the family atmosphere and 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 Jack and everything yeah. on a personal level is, is that yeah is that what you're saying yeah without a doubt yeah without a doubt I just think yeah all that means um, so much more to me than, than um, how far we got and all this sort of stuff. But it, it's, uh, it, it, it was such a, jour a journey that, you know, I'll never, well, I'll never be on a journey like that again. And um, I loved every single minute of it. And it was, it was the bunch of lads that, um, um, that looked after me, they had to look after me sometimes. And, and and cared for me enough to do it, to be honest. Uh, and I loved them all. And then we we walk out, and suddenly, the uh, you see the crowd, and I'd say eighty percent of it is all in green, Irish green, you know, and f Irish flags everywhere. And there's odd bits of blue in odd places. You, you, you just couldn't have. There was something oh, in those, the air. Yeah. You, with that many Irish people in the stadium, you couldn't have lost that game. When Paul McGrath left Manchester United in 1989, it seemed like persistent knee injuries were about to curtail his career. Instead, it lasted another eight years. His legend in Ireland grew even further, and he became a hero to many in Birmingham and beyond. The boys in Clarem Blue, weaving Conkedi Road. Paul, your your reach goes far and wide. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. It's extraordinary. The the villa thing, Paul. Uh, that's just an example of it. Just a sample of, uh, you know, they do call you God over there. Some of them do, and um, you know, for a modest person, that must be pretty strange. It's 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 a bit of a love story, isn't it? Uh, what what happened there? Yeah, I think um, I think it is because I think they thought I was going there for. Um, you know, the last, I think I was, was I 30 or something, mm. 31 maybe. And I think they just thought I was just wanting another payday and going and taking as much off the club as I could and and then just... Yeah, right off into the sunset. Yeah, right off into the sunset. But I, I love the club. I, Villa's a place that a lot of players love playing at um, simply because they, they have a lot of the um, semi-finals there and, and all that sort of stuff. So loads of footballers, if you ask them, you know, they, they love to actually play at Villa Park. But the, for me, then to suddenly say that I was going to be playing there week in, week out. So I, I just went with Villa because... And uh, Graham Taylor was so good to me. Mm. He was so, so good to me. He just said, well, we'll... Uh, we'll it was actually Doug Ellis as well, believe Deadly it or not. Deadly Doug. Deadly Doug, believe it or not. And they said, well, well we'll... Uh, We'll double your wages, whatever your wages were at Manchester United. We'll double them, and we'll we'll get we'll give you more. And I went, you'll double me wages, and you'll give me, you'll talk about giving me more. And so I just went, I, I was going, oh my lord, this is brilliant. So, so, and I realised they wanted me to play for the club so so much that they were willing to do these things for me. So mm -hmm. I thought. I'm going to give this my best shot for the next, however, I think it was only, uh, I think they wanted to do it for two years first and then 
see would my knees hold out and all this sort of stuff. And then I, I, I played uh, seven seasons. Seven seasons, yeah. You mentioned Graham Taylor there. He comes across as a very <coughs> special person because when you went there, I think you were struggling with leaving United, the change that that involved. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, injuries, and, and, and obviously you, would, you had your own personal demons were, were becoming an issue at that time. Yeah. What did Graham Taylor do for you to help you? Um, well, I, I um, yeah, I was, I, was I was struggling with the fact that I was at, in, at a new club and they were all expecting me to, to do things their way and, and go out on the football pitch and do certain things. That's when the physio, Jim, um, Jim Walker, Mm. K, K, I, I went to him and I said, Jim, I, I don't usually train the same way as the other players train. I, I, I love going into the gym and keeping myself fit, going on the bike, you know, because my knees are now a little bit shot to pieces and stuff like that. And Jim said, right, well, I'll, I'll talk to the people that need to be talked to and we'll, we'll cut down your, your um, training sessions and stuff like that and we'll make sure that you're fit going out in the pitch every Saturday and all that sort of st stuff. And um, I think it was Rita, Rita is uh, um, Graeme Taylor's wife. Uh, Graeme came to me and he said, look, I've had a word with Rita and we're willing to have you in our house if you want, Paul, because I'd, I'd had a, I'd had a, a quite, quite serious uh, um, thing happen to me while I was, while I was, you know, I, while I was uh, on a downer, basically. Mm. So, and and Graham had come come to me and just said, Paul, look, if you want to come and stay with myself and Rita, you're welcome to do that, and we'll 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 get you right, and we'll 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 uh, we'll, we'll get you well again. And I just thought, Jesus, this man's a saint, wanting the likes of me down <laughs> at his house. So, yeah. but I didn't go. I didn't go. I I, I uh, but I but I did start. I did start repaying him in the performances that I was started giving after that. Um, I hope I hope he feels the same way because um, yeah, he got the he, he got I think he got the England manager at the end of that season. Yeah, so. you, you had a great season then with him. And but you mentioned Jim Walker, who's more than just a physio. Look, he he's another in incredible person, not just for for your body. Yeah, the guy who says we got to look after this guy's knees and we'll get the result. But he was. He helped you, protected you over those yeah. years as well, didn't he? Yeah, Jim Walker. And it was Jim and um, uh, Mick Byrne. I think they both had a joint uh, venture together and said, look, what are we going to do? You're, even to get me home to play for Ireland, they had to make arrangements then. When the, Who's going to drop me to which plane? Jim was going to come on the plane with me. It was eventually. Mm. So it was a great trip for Jim. Jim was delighted <laughs> with himself. It was all brilliantly laid out and then I could concentrate and just do, you know walking onto the football pitch and doing the best I could for for all the people who were who were doing the best they could for me and that yeah. and honestly it was that simple big ron comes back then um as you say graham taylor moves on and, and joseph vengelos is there for a year and that's not maybe on, on the same page <laughs> but big ron comes back who you'd worked with before and you this is the first season of the premier league then and Villa are flying, and you in particular. Is this the best football of your career? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, because we 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 got Dean Saunders then, and we had uh, Daly and Atkinson was 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 had come over to us, and and there was so many players that mm. wanted to play for Aston Villa now, and uh, you had Tony Daly, who was another one, Dwight York. We had these lads. They were always going to score goals. It was just about how many. And sometimes they would just rip people apart. And it was like five goals here, six goals there. Mm. And, and we, if we let in one, you were, the other team did well, to be honest. And that's, we, concentrated, we concentrated on just defending, not letting goals in. And suddenly we were flying up, up, the, up the leagues, you know. You win the, the Player of the Year award, the PFA Player of the Year award. It's a hugely prestigious honour. I think only six defenders in the 40-odd years have ever won it. I mean, Virgil van Dijk, you know, for, for example, in recent years, yeah. John Terry. Um, it, it must be an inc incredible night to go down there and, and pick up, pick up oh, that award from... Was it Bobby Charlton who presented it? Bobby Charlton presented it to me as well. What yeah. are your memories of that? Um, 
Bobby used to stop me every so often, even when I was walking around Old Trafford, and say, "Look, just try and get your act together, Paul, because you, you know you're you're a good player, but try and get your act together." Like, and he'd give me actually good advice, you know. And and same with Sir Sir Matt. Mm. Forget what they said talking about you off the pitch. Just do what you do on the pitch and keep doing it. And and it was lovely to hear from names like that, you know, to to actually hear those people saying. Look, son, you just keep doing what you're doing on the football pitch. And I used to love those two people for just saying that those little words to me. But um yeah, it was it was that was one of the most incredible evenings I've I've ever had because Bobby Charlton, it's 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 a World Cup winner. It's and then to win this thing is just it's mind boggling, like because it, it usually goes to a forward anyway. So yeah. It is incredible. Four years after you possibly had R written, written off, written off. Written. Um, you know, you, you touched on it there. You are producing your best football on the field, but off the field, and you, you've written about this in your book and talked about it really honestly. Your, you know, life is in is in bad shape. I think your marriage was 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 um, going off the rails. The drinking is 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 an issue. Was football an escape for you at that time, or was your were your struggles off the field fueling? Your performances on the pitch. What, what was, what was fueling this? Um, no, I was going through some stuff with with I think my my second wife at that stage, and I just uh, so it was hard to keep everything under control. You know, when I won that award, I knew that I had to go away then to play a World Cup, mm. and I'm thinking to myself, well, how can I go away to play a World Cup? Because at that stage, my left my left shoulder had given out totally given out so and I, and I thought well I played one game it had happened the night of the Manchester night the, the, uh, the 94, the League, 94 Cup League Cup final and I'd knock at that Jim's thing at about 3 o'clock in the night and I just said Jim my whole shoulder is killing me and I, and, and, and I don't know what to do and all this sort of stuff but then, then I played the in the World Cup and this thing was hanging by my side so it was ridiculous to, to, to even let me play so, so later on in the competition, there was just nothing I could do about it. Mm. There was people running at me that I, that I was never gonna, I was never gonna stop them. So they were just running in and having shots and yeah. stuff like that. And I, I was looking, you know, less than a footballer, I think. Um, l let's talk about that '94 League Cup final. It's against Man United. Five years on, you're desperate to play after what you, you talked about with the with the arm. Yeah. Um, but you play it through the, p the pain. It's a great day for Villa. And then you meet Ferguson on the pitch afterwards, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, m I met him in the tunnel, just in the tu tunnel there. And uh, and he came over and he gave me the on an almighty belt in the stomach. And he just said, well done, son. Well done, son. Yeah. You know, so he was, you know, he was gracious in, 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 in defeat and stuff like that. And I, I you know, he was a, decent to me um, a after football and stuff. So... I've no qualms with him anymore. Yeah. I, I really do think he he did everything that was right for Manchester United, and and so I I can't uh, say anything bad about him. I wouldn't. Um, you won another League Cup then at Villa. Um, Ron, unfortunately, he he was sacked, and, and Brian Little came in, and and it was a sense he wanted to maybe change things. Yeah, maybe bring in younger players. Was, was that a difficult one for you, even though you were? Obviously, advancing in years, did you feel like you had yeah. something left in you? I, I honestly did. I, I mean, it was in uh, eighty uh, or ninety six that we were playing Leeds. I think it was in the League Cup, and uh, I thought I'd, I, I, I'd uh, done quite well in in certain areas, you know. And uh, mm. I think he didn't, <laughs> mm. and it was as simple as that. But he, he was. Uh, but he was always dead straight with me, you know. Um, and I, I think, re, you know, he was the first one that kind of said to me, and, and he was trying to give it to me as easy as possible, but, you know, you're not as good as you probably were three or four years ago. Mm. So, and I did take that on board, and I, I kind of... But I, but then I went to Derby uh, for a while, and, um, and I just loved it, because they were in the bottom... I think they were in about the bottom six... And then uh, Jim Smith, who was a, a car, a car, another friend of Ron's, mm. a character, you know, loved a, a glass of whiskey and stuff mm. like that. And I went, I went there, and um, and I got we. I, I said like, if, if I can keep you in this league, 
will you give me a bonus of a certain amount of money? And then he had me playing centre half and then we were flying up the league. <laughs> and what a team they were, by the way. The mm. kids were brilliant. I was thinking, these kids are amazing. And and I wanted to play al- alongside these boys for about four years. But uh, So we were flying up the league and I was thinking, this is the easiest money I've ever <laughs> earned in my life. So, yeah, we, we, we got out of trouble. Yeah. And I was and I love Jim Smith because I, I used to go in on Fridays and then I'd be off until the kind of... Unless we had a midweek game, I'd be off until the next Friday. The 1994 World Cup and certainly the performance in Giant Stadium against Italy, it's probably regarded by many as your pinnacle in an Irish shirt, but the road to get there is is a bumpy one, uh, I suppose. You know, when you think about it, you mean you talked about it in, uh, before, that, that Jack and Mick Byrne, um, how they managed you, how they looked after you as you were going through difficulties, how the, the other players minded you. Were, were, were they a difficult few years in, in the lead-up to that when you were coming over to join the team for, for, for get-togethers? Um, Is that where, where Jack really showed his humanity towards you? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, Jack, Jack was always good to me. But Jack understood from, from the 94, uh, from the Manchester United game, that, that I had a, a, a serious um, wastage thing in my, sh- in my left shoulder. Mm. So, and, and he, I remember, and I, I used to think that Jack had a, a little bit of a friendship thing going with me. And I remember um, Mick, Mick Byrne came up to me and, and said, uh, Oof, Jack, Paul, I think Jack's thinking of taking uh, Dave O'Leary if you're not right, if you're not ready for... It. And I was in shock. I thought, you what? So there was a real chance you weren't going to yeah, go to the 94 World Cup because of the because virus of, in the be, shoulder? Yeah, because yeah. of this virus. And, and uh, Mick was doing all sorts of weights with me, but I couldn't, I couldn't even lift a, a normal weight, you know. I hadn't got the, the power in that arm. But um, And then I was delighted when Jack, when I was in the squad and we, I, I was going, you know, because mm. then I had more time to work on my, on my arm doing weights and stuff like that. But I, I really thought he was going to bring Dave. I don't know what he said, like a, just as a threat or something like that, but I was yeah. thinking, Jack, it's, it's me. <laughs> like, you know, you're going you're gonna to throw me under a bus. But, uh, and I wanted to do brilliant for him as well because he had been so good to me. He had been... Um, really really good to me over the years and I wanted to be part of it I, I, I didn't want uh, you know I didn't want 1990 just to be the one that I was involved in I wanted this yeah uh, you know for me and him to be honest um, the, the, the day itself the night itself in, uh, in, in New York in Giant Stadium it's, it's again it's one of those famous moments you step onto the field and you see the fans around you. Is, what is that? What you remember? Um, the color of the occasion. Do you do you do you have memories of just what it felt like on that night? Yeah, I remember walking out, and we hadn't seen the crowds because we hadn't. Mm-hmm. We didn't want to get too hot and all that sort of stuff. And then we we walk out, and suddenly, the uh, you see the crowd, and I'd say eighty percent of it is all in green, Irish green, you know and f- Irish flags everywhere. And there's odd bits of blue in odd places. So we're, we're going, oh my God, the Irish have shown up in droves. So we're, oh, and then, uh, but then I, I'm, I'm suddenly looking around and I'm going to one or two of the other players. Oh, Jesus, we can't feckin' lose the game tonight now. We just can't lose this. We can't lose this game. And the other lads are saying that as well. So, mm. you know, you, you just couldn't have, there was something oh, in the air. Yeah, you, with that many Irish people in the stadium, you couldn't have lost that game. Where did that performance come from, from you? It, it, people say that, it, you know, they talk about golfers being in the zone or, you know, tennis players, where it, 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 was, it looked like that, from your point of view, that you, you just knew where the ball was going to be. You had a kind of telepathic understanding. Like, how did it feel playing that game and it's I, being in your shoes? 
Yeah, I have to say there, there was there was once or twice that I, I felt really comfortable because I, and I totally relaxed. But things did work out for us. But I was amazed by the, the the kids that were playing that day. And Jason came on. I know Terry Phelan, Dennis, and every one of them were putting in tackles that I couldn't believe. You know, they were mm. putting in in last ditch, ditch tackles, and I was just thinking, Jesus, these kids are going to get us to where we want to go tonight. And it was just brilliant. And I loved it, John Sheridan, you know. So we played as a team that night, and every one of us gave 110%. Ray's goal was a little <laughs> bit lucky. but I, I think you're being modest, though. Oh, I, you no, know, I, because it, it was a, a, you were a colossus that night. Honestly, it, just, it was one of those nights when, when every one of us, I swear to Christ, was just saying, no, you're not, not tonight. Yeah. You, won't, you can't beat us tonight. And, and honestly, I think that was from what the first thing we saw when we went out there was that Irish flags everywhere and we, w we just weren't going to get beaten. And, and uh, the, only, the only time um, I, I loved the ending in the game because I remember they, they took a quick corner and I knew that I, I was the only person on that pitch that could take two steps, jump in the air, and no one else could have done that and headed that last ball. Mm. And I headed it right over the bar. And I, and I knew no one else could have done that because I was, only the, I was totally in the right place to do it. And that's the only time that I kind of relaxed and just went, oh, no one can get it, only me. So the two steps were made, and I just launched myself in the air, and I just belted it over the bar, and I thought, oh, now I feel comfortable. And then... The ref blew up and it was it was brilliant. That night must be an amazing memory to have. It is against them because th th to me they're they're brilliant, brilliant footballers. They're all br Donna Doni. Jeez, mm. now I can now I can talk to my grandkids about Donny Doni. <laughs> what a great player he was! But we beat them that mm. night. We beat them. <laughs> you know, Baggio, great player. We beat them though. <laughs> After that. Um, Things kind of went went a bit downhill, I suppose. We got to the second round, and but unfortunately went out. Do you think that was the the beginning of the end under Jack? Um, you know, in terms of going out of '94 and then maybe the, the campaign that followed. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think uh, in the manner we went out as well. I think there were just breaks again. Mm. You know, breaks on us, and and uh, but. I, yeah, I, I'd love to be able to say that I, I could hold my hands up and say, I, I, I should have said to Jack, Jack, you know, even in, in playing, um, you know, the, 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 the two games that I played or whatever it was, that, that or three, sorry, three games that I played, that I, I should not have been playing because of my show. Yeah. I'm delighted I did play the first game in particular because it did all go kind of right for me. But... Um, but Jack, Jack's very loyal like that, you know what I mean? So he, he won't, if you tell him you're fit and you're well, I think mm. he'll, he'll, he'll throw you in anyway. And I didn't want to be um, cut out of anything really, to be honest. But I think that there was younger players there and there was better players probably that just could have just maybe got us to the next. And it was a, look, a lucky goal that Packy kind of came in. Um, Afterwards, do you think did, did Jack stay on too long, or was he too loyal to players? I th um, yeah. In in the the year or two that followed. Yeah, I think he was very very loyal to the the players who who he fa he thought had had done so much. I think for him, you know, and he didn't want to start picking players out mm. and saying, "Well, you're going to have to go," or you know, three player three players that started with me are going to have to go, and then maybe another to the next get cut out with the next squad and I don't think he wanted to do it that way so I, I think that's why um, he just wanted us all to stay together and he wanted us all to go together if you know what I mean not not yeah. not go together but he wanted to be gone um, kind of before he had to chop the team up and, yeah. and I think we all wanted it to last forever though but the, the, the night in <clears throat> at Anfield and yeah. the defeat to the Dutch and it, yeah. it, it's over for him. Was that a sad, sad time? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a very sad time for him. But I think it, 
he 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 was um i think he was ready for it though mm. you know i honestly do i think he he'd 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 run the course of the 10 years and i think that's what i think that's what he 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 realized was was going to have to be done next meaning i was i'm going to have to disband this team yeah. and, and try and put another team together i'm i'm not willing to do that mm. and i think that's that's a lovely a lovely way to go out as well Um, in in the the film, the Jack Charlton film, towards the end of his life, he is suffering from dementia, and he's shown some footage of that old time, and he, he doesn't remember a lot. Yeah. But you come walking out at one point, and he says he turns to his wife and says, "Paul McGrath." Paul McGrath. So, yeah. was there a special connection? You think? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I wouldn't have played half the games. Mm. If, if there wasn't, um, I would not have been able to play half the games, and 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 I loved playing the games from, I genuinely did. I I loved running harder than I've ever run probably on a football pitch, for hit, for that man in particular, uh, because I really did. I loved him. I loved the chances he gave me. I loved the chats he'd have with me. I loved the fact that he he knew. I think he knew a little bit about my backstory that he. He gave me a little bit of um, rope that he probably wouldn't have given to too many of the, the other players. Mm. And and I think he knew uh, on any given day I'd give him 110% if I was 110% myself. So he certainly did. He was, he was, he was, yeah, I think he, he so he was, he was a very kind man to me. Mm. The end for you comes um, under Mick then, Mick McCarthy takes over. Um, that again, a bit like the Villa thing. Was that a hard one where one of your old teammates had to come in and he felt he had to make changes? Um, did you have any resentment towards Mick? Not one no. bit. Not one bit. No, because I, I, I found it, it now it happened in a funny way. So I, I, uh, I didn't mind a half as a half as much, because I'd been, I'd not been selected for one one of the uh, Irish matches. And then when I uh, I was brought back in then for uh, I don't know what it was Macedonia or something, and uh, um, what's his name now uh, Farley Gareth Farley was a, an Aston Villa kid who was working at Aston Villa with me and we were flying over together and Gar Mick had invi Mick had brought one one player too many and Gareth kept in my ear on the plane all the way over saying Paul. I'm going to get sent back. I'm going to get sent back. This, you know, why, why did he even bring me over? I'm going to get sent back. And I kept saying, Car, please stop in the air. Just, you do your best. You're a good footballer. You can, you know, take it down in the midfield. He was a midfielder. Take it down in the midfield and show him you, you're a bloody good player. And so we were all sitting on the back of the bus one day and we we're all getting off and Mick is up the front of the bus. <laughs> And all the players are lining out to, to walk. We'd all played the five sides and stuff like that. And I'd put in quite I, what I thought was a brilliant display. No, not mm. a brilliant display, but good display. And um, I always got off last because I was on the right at the end of the bus. And that, as I'm stepping off, Mick holds the rail of the bus. And he goes, uh, Paul, can I have a quick word with you? And I, I went, yeah, no problem at all, Mick, no problem. He says, Paul, uh, we, we, we won't be needing you. And I, and I actually started giggling because I was thinking of Gareth. I was thinking Gar Gareth's at me like this for the mm. half the week, and Mick said, uh, "Paul, we, 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 you know, you can head off back to, um, you know, wherever it was I, I was going." And I said, "No problem at all, Mick." Now I was gig, like I say, I was giggling a lot, but I, but then I was thinking, of all the things to do, I thought. Bring me over as the as the oldest player, and uh, and and then just to just to do it, kind of in front of the lads to mean that I'm the one that then has to be walking out of the hotel that day saying goodbye to some of the lads and stuff like that. And but but I took it all in my stride and I just said fair enough, Mick, no problem mm -hmm. at all, and I just left that way. But I, and I I and I love Mick to this day. I still think he's one of the. 
the the the, the reasons that um, we we got so far in certain competitions because he is he, he's he's a, he's a cracking lad, you know. Mm. But um, and I told Gareth, and Gareth was in stitches of course, like thinking, you know, well at least it wasn't me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Was um, your your testimonial then in 1998, forty thousand nearly turn up. Added your boys are there as well. Yeah. Um, must have been mixed emotions though. I, end of a real an incredible journey, and maybe thinking about life after football as well, and yet such an outpouring of of gratitude and. Oh, and love. I, I I couldn't believe it. Like how many people were there, and and Dock United had helped in that in the range, and you know uh, all all the all the things that went on and surrounded that. So I was just I was amazed by the the people's reaction, and 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 it, you know I I I thought I'd I've had a reasonable career and stuff like that. Mm. So and I've enjoyed it as well, and I always enjoy looking at football, even to this day. Like I love watching good players play football and for everyone to turn up that day was just amazing and um, I'll, I'll forever be indebted to Irish people. If, if one of your grandkids or if somebody who'd never seen you came and asked you what sort of player were you? What did you, what did you like about football? What did you enjoy about it? How would you d explain yourself I, as a player? What was it about it? I, I, love ta I do love tackling yeah. but I like doing it fairly. I, I don't I, I've never gone out and I've never I, I don't think I've ever been sent off in in the in the in English context in an English game but I love tackling I love tackling physical contest hard yeah yeah I'm, I'm not an you know if I, if I see a ball I'll go for the ball I'll take the ball I'll, and if it's the man's afterwards it'll the man will get taken as well but I, I'm, I'm I'm fair I've been tackled a couple of times when people I know people have tried to hurt me and it doesn't doesn't worry me, but I, I know, I tell him, you know, mm. if, if you want to play it that way, I can play it that way. And I will play it that way if you want me to. But I've never went out to hurt anyone on a football pitch um, because I'd, I'd, I'd rather be a sportsman mm. than one of these lads who goes out to, to ruin someone's career or something. Mm. It's not, not in my nature. Um, did you struggle with life after football in terms of not being a footballer anymore? It's uh, something that many players have talked about, that moment where you're no longer oh. going into the dressing room. Yeah, and that's the biggest, um, that's the hardest part, I think, for every footballer, that, that daily routine of, of hiding some... I know it sounds, it's very uh, immature and all this sort of thing, but just, you know, playing pranks on each other, or in, in my case, it was just going into a bunch of comedians, because we had... At Aston Villa, there was so many lads that were just so funny, and you you miss you do miss that, and you miss uh, you miss the camaraderie. Of just uh, if you're going on a trip somewhere together, we, we you know we would fly all around the world together sometimes, and you miss all that. And then when you do see them at a golfing tournament now or something, it's mm. it's it's just great to see them. You know, it's it's. Uh, you know, but I'm happy, and again, I'm one of those people who's kind of happy in his own company as well. So I don't, I'm not a great mixer, but I am with people that I've known and 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 like and um, and have loved. You know, like mm. the, the the lads, y you do you you sort of just bond with them, and and so th it's it's a, yeah. you know it's a lovely it's a lovely way of getting to know people and having a laugh. Um, you did the book with Vincent Hogan um, a, few, a few years after you finished, and it's regarded as one of the greatest sporting books mm. ever written. Your honesty is so powerful. You know, you, you laid it all out there, what you'd been through. Why did you s decide to do it at that time? Um, yeah, I was. I'd, I'd been asked it a right few times to do it, you know, and I'd done one, one with Cal, uh, Cal Dervin, and... Um, and I just, I honestly did just think that Vincent Hogan was, uh, had, had said to me once or twice, Paul, I'd love to do a second book and stuff like that. And I, I was going, geez, I don't, I don't want everything put on, on uh, put out there again. But then Vincent said a few more, 
four more times to me. And, and, and to be honest, I really did like Vin, um, Vincent. Mm. So I said, ah, yeah, well, I'll, well, we'll do it and we'll see how it goes and stuff like that. So, yeah, and the more we were doing it, the more I started trusting Vincent. And uh, and I thought he did it in a great way as well, you know, by by getting other people's opinions and stuff like that and writing the whole book around you know, friends were saying things about, you know, and it kind of worried me in, in some respects because I was going to be reading what friends taught me and and how they, 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 they taught. But it was, it was kind of caring in the end because they were just saying he needs, he, I think he needs a bit of help and he might need uh, looking after. Um, someone might need to be looking after what, it, what he's going to do afterwards when he's finished football because he's not very, uh, you know, on that, on that, the clever side of things. When when I'm getting businesses or something together, or what am I going to do? But uh, it, and things are still working out okay for me. Mm. So I, I think I'm either. It, it did help you to, to to put it all down, did it? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it did very much so, very much so. And 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 like I say, Vincent did it in a very caring way, by by getting people who actually did give a, a hoot about me, mm. and just making making me maybe see that you know geez you can't go on the way you're going on because mm. you're just going to make a, a a fool of yourself really to be honest and did you ever think of how it would have benefited others to read about what you who, who are going through the same things to yeah benefit your experiences and, and and help them over time yeah well that's why i never i never asked for things to be cut out or anything like that i, I I tell my sons not to read not to read certain things and my daughter not to read because because there's some of it is a bit of a mess and stuff like that, but other other than that, uh, other people, yeah, I know there's other people, and I I I think I, t I tell about like I wet the bed till I was seventeen or something like that, and you got your sheets hung out the windows and all this sort of stuff just to embarrass you and all that bullshit, but uh, you know, and all the things that I I think were horrific at the time and scary at the time because you didn't want the whole school known which they would have done when you walk in that you'd, you'd pissed your bed the other the, the night before or something like that and that's horrific for kids mm. so it was wrong what they were doing but you know but then look i may I'm, I, was, I turned into a footballer so that was okay mm. it's okay now anyway yeah and i'm still i'm not wetting my bed now so that's good so here you are in your 60s and looking brilliant and I think of the noise of the crowds, the thousands in the, in the terraces and the stands and on the streets of Dublin welcoming you home and the ups and, and downs, as you've mentioned, yeah. of your life. Um, how does the quiet life suit you now? Perfectly. Mm. <laughs> I love it. I honestly do. I, I, you know, but I also love, and, and this well, I, I, I li I'd like people to know that I, I love chatting football. I love mixing with people. People think, because I say I'm a, I'm a little bit shy and stuff mm. like that. I, I do talk and I do love chatting about certain things, but I'm just not um, o overly, I'm, I, you know, I don't run over to people and start wanting to join their conversations and stuff like mm. that. But I, I love people. Wexford suits you. Wexford does suit me. It yeah. does. It does. You even go to GA matches and I do, time yeah. to time. Yeah, and I love it because... You know, I love the rugby. I love GA. I love uh, watching the hurl, and I, um, yeah, I love I love it all. I, I I go to the Wexford Youth Games as well. So, you know, because I, I I'll always love sport anyway, mm. any sort of sport. So, uh, and you mind yourself? I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I I have to. Yeah, because sometimes there's one or two. Yeah, there's one or two people are always gonna want a, li a little bit of banter and a little bit of fun with you and stuff like that. I'm getting too old for it to be messing about with mm. with people that I don't want to mess about with, really, to be mm. honest, you know. But I, I mind myself, yeah. Um, you lost your mother last year, which, you know, a few months, uh, I think, after Jack as well. Um, and what did it mean to you to have a strong, such a strong relationship with her towards uh, the end? Um, yeah, it was, it was tough because um, we weren't allowed, it was, it was at that moment where you weren't allowed to yeah. drive up, you weren't allowed to do this, you weren't allowed to do that. But I, um, yeah, I drove up anyway, um, you know, when she was in hospital and stuff like that. And 
it was horrific, really, to be honest, to, to, to see what she was going through and how she was going through it. And, I, um, yeah, profound effect on me, I think, because I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't ever want to see um, uh, anyone else in, in either in my family or anyone else's family to have to die that way mm -hmm. because that was just horrific. I don't know how you can let people um, drift off like that, you know, because it's, it was horrific to have you to watch your mother um, dying in that way. I, I, you know, it's barbar barbaric, mm. and I, I, I'm not, you know, I just, I wasn't comfortable at all. I'm not comfortable around that anyway. I'm not com comfortable around people, um, you know, it wasn't, it w just, you know. It was tough. Yeah, it was tough, very yeah. tough. So, but, uh, and I, I, I just, I, I don't know. But I'm then I'm not a doctor, and I'm not, you know, I have nothing to do with that side of things. But I just, they, they, I shouldn't have been invited up there to to have to watch that. That's something else. Um, she was, she must be very proud of you when when you were and doing I, things on the field. Was she? Did she watch your matches? Yeah, she was actually really good with football. She, yeah, she could tell, like, she was brilliant at that. At, at, being able to say whether a goal was a goal, whether, whether someone was offside, she'd get it before me, and she'd say he was definitely offside. It touched his foot when it ran through, so it was there. And she'd have she'd be right. And she went to the um, uh, my stepfather. She married a, a lad Noel Loud, who was actually played for Shamrock Rovers, and he had taken her to the uh, 1966 uh, World Cup final. Wow. The final, so she'd watch this final, and um, uh, incredibly, then, like I, you know, her kid. Then years later, because my mum used to kick ball with me when I was really young. Now I wasn't with my mum a lot because obviously I went into the the orphanage and stuff like that. But she, yes, football. She had a great connection to football. She was an Arsenal supporter. I don't know how that happened because <laughs> I was a Chelsea supporter, and then obviously Aston Villa. But she had a heart towards the end, and that's, uh, but, mm. you know, but a lot of people have had it hard since this thing started. Yeah. When you think of um, all that's been talked about in, in recent years about what, what girls like her went through and were, by, were forced to go through by the attitudes of the time, the, the cruelty that was around, really, yeah. at the time, and you hear so many stories coming out um, in the last few years about, you know, mother and child homes, uh, etc. Does it help to think that people are now kind of recognizing the, the cruelties and the things that were done in this country oh, at that yeah. time? Yeah. That she endured? And yeah, well, she, she um, yeah, she wouldn't have, have uh, endured it too much because she, uh, when I was, I was uh, given up for adoption as soon as she arrived in Dunleary. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I went straight to uh, foster parents at first. And then I went back to my mum's for about a, a month and a half, a month, I think it was. And then I went straight into the bird's nest, which was, was the orphanage that I stayed in f for, um, well, till I was, I was, I think I was 12. And then I was, uh, when I got out of there, then the second one, it was eight, eight, um, 18. I was 18 when I left mm. that. So that, yeah. So, and, and um, yeah, but my, my, uh, my mum always, came down to see me and stuff like that so that was great yeah there's a lovely bit in, in your book when your mother talks about guardian angels you know and, and she's talking about okune who was a, a, your sister oh yeah 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 and it's a really lovely thing she she passed away at a, a young age that's right yeah but when you think about the people we've talked about whether it's jack or, or jim walker or graham taylor even mick Byrne, obviously yeah. the people like that do you feel like in some ways that there have been always somebody oh most definitely, because keeping an eye, yeah, which without a doubt, I've been lost in countries. I, I I've been I've been in in countries, and I literally ju I've just jumped in a, a, a cab and gone for a drink somewhere, mm. and and no one knows where I am, and I'm always I always get found like so, somehow, but um, but yeah, there's there's always been people have, that have looked out for me anyway, you know, and I and I and I, and I don't mean to cause people. 
offence or, or or think that they'll they'll always be there. They'll always come and get you, Paul. Don't worry about it. You're sitting enjoying it, the music and the. But but p people have been very very good to me, and I think um, you know, and Jimmy Walker and and Mick Byrne and Ch um, Charlie O'Leary, the, the the people that you wouldn't, they they've always looked out for 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 the lads. I think you know the lads. Who are, who are maybe not so confident and not so, um, yeah. But I was a little bit of a rogue as well, though. Mm. I like and I kind of like being a bit of a rogue, <laughs> you know. People used to call you the, the a gentle giant on, on the field, and in the midst of all that, though, you must have been a f phenomenally had a phenomenal determination as well. Looking back on it all, to do what you did, to get through what you did play through the pain of, of, of injuries and even to prove people wrong <clears throat> or to, to come through. W was that a part of it? Were you somebody who also had that part of you that was incredibly determined? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, ha I, w I must say that, yeah. I, I loved... I actually did like proving people wrong. You know, you do hold things like that. But You had I, an inner fire at times. Yeah, you do, because you don't... You don't like to be told you're not good enough for a certain team, and you're 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 ruining things for everyone else by staying in football. Even that that inner determination took you a long way, Paul. Um, if you could say something to the kid with with the football at, at Pierce Rovers or kicking around with his mates, Ooh. with everything that you've done and everything you've 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 known in, in the time since, what would you say to that kid? Um, oh, I'd say thanks for learning quickly, because uh, I, because I needed to, to learn the whole game from the when I watched them play on their own that mm -hmm. that same team that Pierce Rovers team, they were actually quite a good team. When I stepped into it, I I was upsetting everyone. I was chasing the ball. I didn't know where I was, and it was only till till Tommy Heffernan and to, Tommy Heffernan told me the positions I was supposed to be in and stuff like that. He actually just taught me. So if it was from that, I, I, it, it's to him I'm, I probably owe uh, the biggest grat of, uh, uh, the, bi the biggest debt, sorry, of gratitude. Mm. Because he was the one that told me, don't be running over there when you're supposed to be here. Don't be doing that. You can't be chasing everything. You can't be, you know. And I think that, yeah. You, you know, did learn quickly. I d well, every, I did, every step. I did because I wanted to be in the team. Yeah. And it was as simple as that. And it, same with Jack. As soon as he stuck me in midfield, I was going, I, I, I play wherever you want me. Wherever you, you want me to play, I'll play because I'm in, I've got a green jersey on. In 100 years' time, if they talk about Paul McGrath, the footballer, what would you like to think they'd say? Um, good tackler. <laughs> good tackler. Um, yeah, and I gave, I gave my best. I honestly did give my best. Can't ask for much more you than know, that. That's the truth. Paul, thanks for telling us your story. Tell me it's no problem brilliant. at all. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Nice to see you again as well.